Molly Blue, and I am going to tell you how to deal with unsolvable problems. I believe that problems are just opportunities to grow and overcome your fears. Some problems are unsolvable, like the death of a loved one. Instead of turning your back on your problems or avoiding it, you should face it. Don't try to protect yourself or hide from it. There is a poem called The Oyster and the Grain of Sand by an anonymous author. The poem is about an oyster who gets a grain of sand stuck in his shell that he cannot remove. He didn't blame the sea or the currents for doing this. Instead, he said, since I cannot remove it, I'll try to improve it. I'll read you the end of the poem. And the small grain of sand that had bothered him so was a beautiful pearl, all richly aglow. Now the tale has a moral, for isn't it grand what an oyster can do with the morsel of sand? What couldn't we do if we'd only begin with some of the things that get under our skin? In this poem, the oyster has a problem. It is unsolvable. Instead of whining about it, he decided to live with it and overcome it. In result, he made something beautiful, a pearl. In the lesson that Francis read, Jacob, who stole Esau's blessing years ago, had to swallow his pride and face it again. Jacob lied to Esau, and reaching out to him like that could not have been easy. Like the oyster and Jacob, I too had an unsolvable problem. My family and I are all skiers. My brothers and I have been skiing since we were four. During the winter, we drive up to Tahoe as much as we can, spending countless hours in the car for a weekend of skiing. I wasn't the best skier, and I was never motivated to ski much. But the rest of my family skied, so I did too. But one winter, when I was about 10 years old, I was stuck on a chairlift for about 20 minutes. During that time, I felt hopeless and alone. I felt stuck and stranded on this steel chair. I kept waiting for the cable to vibrate and the chair to swing forward. But as it remained motionless, I started to panic. I was frozen. I couldn't do anything. I could barely talk. Finally, it moved, but I was still terrified. That was the tipping point for me. That was when I refused to ski anymore. After the chairlift episode, I stopped skiing. When everyone went up to the mountain, I begged my parents to let me stay in our condo instead. A day of skiing can last up to eight hours. I had to wait eight hours alone in our empty condo. During those hours, I would have to skip lunch with my family and friends up on the mountain. After a couple of days leasing out, I found ways to meet up with my family. I would ride the slow, unthreatening gondola to the lodge, where we could have lunch together. But then, I would just ride back down while everyone else went skiing together. All my whining to my parents, staying at home and missing skiing, drove everyone crazy. I dragged everyone with me in my stubborn attempts to avoid skiing. By the time spring came, I had missed an entire season of skiing. When winter came again, I decided I could maybe just do the smaller runs. When I got to the top of the run, I was terrified. Something I knew so well seemed so alien, so unfamiliar. I mentally forgot how to ski. I couldn't do it. I totally forgot the technique. I lost it. My brothers and I, or my brothers thought it was a joke. When my brothers and my friends would ski big hard runs, I would be on the bunny hill. Easy baby runs. I felt like a failure. Once again, I tried to give up, but my mother refused to let me. She said, Just suck it up. All of your fears are just in your head. You've been skiing since you were four. There's nothing to be afraid of. With some tough love, I realized how much of a coward I was being. I did know how to ski, but I subconsciously tried to forget. The truth was, my family would be going to Tahoe every year, and what am I going to do? Sit around? I couldn't wimp out of this, and the solution was very clear. But it was much. My solution was very clear: ski. But it was much more complicated for me. I realized that there were lots of reasons why I was trying to avoid skiing. To start, I wasn't very good. While missing an entire season of skiing, everyone improved, leaving me behind a little. Everyone had to wait for me to finish the run we were on. And my parents couldn't ski their type of runs. They would have to ski on small runs with me. I held everyone back. The 
The chairlifts were another reason I didn't want to ski. I was scared that they would stop forever. My fear was completely irrational, though. The lift would always keep moving, and the fear of falling off the lift would be like waiting for a meteor to hit me. It's highly unlikely. Even if it did stop for a while, it still wouldn't be stuck there forever. After much thought and encouragement from my parents, I decided to just swallow my pride, stop chickening out, and try improving my problems. The next time we drove up to Tahoe, I decided to take steam lessons again. As I learned to ski again, I began to enjoy it more and not just ski to keep up with others. I, w I still wasn't as good as my brothers, but I didn't care. I was skiing again, and I liked it. I learned that I shouldn't just give up on problems that I can't solve. The hardest problems are the ones that seem inescapable. But once I decided to face my problem and make the best of it, there was no problem anymore. In big problems, sometimes the best thing to do is take a deep breath and face it. If you don't like chores or a school subject that particularly challenges you, instead of avoiding it, conquer it. If we look back on our problems like the oyster in the poem or Jacob, we will see that our problems can have a way of fixing themselves sometimes. You just have to let them. If we, are, if we see our problems from a different angle, we will see that it's also an opportunity. Whenever you have a big problem that you can't stand, don't let it ruin your day. Put a smile on and see how you can tackle it. See how you can grow.